Hello everyone, I'm Lindsay Dowd and I'm delighted to welcome you to our next Link Group podcast on the topic of dormant assets expansion. If you're a regular listener to our podcast, you probably caught our conversation with Robert Welsh, Group Secretary at Tesco, about his work with the Dormant Asset Scheme. Today, with the Government consultation on proposed expansion of Dormant Asset Scheme, we are delighted to look at this further from the perspective of Reclaim Fund. Reclaim Fund is a non-profit organisation set up in 2011, which makes it possible for money in dormant bank and building society accounts to be used to help good causes. And today we're delighted to be joined by Adrian Smith, the Chief Executive, as well as our own Head of Industry, Jay Baker. So Adrian and Jay, welcome. Thank you. Very good to be here. Thanks. Um, so I wonder if, first of all, Adrian, could you possibly give us a quick recap around the history of the Dormant Asset Scheme, why it was set up and what was achieved so far and, and how a Reclaim Fund really fits into this in more detail? I can do, yeah. Well, well firstly, uh, Lindsay, thank you for the opportunity of being able to uh, take part in this. I think Reclaim Fund is one of those organisations that not many people know about. Um, we are part of one, one part of a very complex scheme in terms of how dormant assets is used. Um, but we're not particularly well known and that, that really is be- for, for a, a, a purpose um, on the basis that uh, we only perform one part of a function that I'll talk about. In terms of history, we were set up, as I think you alluded to, in 2011. In fact, before 2011, there was a, a lot of work going on on dormant assets And back in 2008, an Act of Parliament was passed to facilitate the ability to be able to use dormant bank and building society accounts to fund good causes. And it it really is a unique scheme in that the customers of banks and building societies across the UK who've lost touch with their money, and when I say lost touch, that money has to be 15 years or older, Um, and can't have had any uh, transactions uh, in in that period. And that money is then passed from banks and building societies to Reclaim Fund. And we act as an intermediary between that money, the banks and building societies, and that money also being passed out to good causes. So um, as you rightly mentioned, we were set up in 2011, but between 2009 and 2011, a lot of work went on Um, to set the organisation up. We are regulated by the FCA. It was the FSA at the time, now the FCA. We're a small financial services company. And we've really got some very important uh, sort of principles at our heart. The first of which is that we want to be able to always meet reclaims in perpetuity from reclaiming customers. So in practical terms, that means that if a bank or building society customer has lost touch with an account and it is passed to reclaim fund, then that customer can always get their money back from their bank or building society. And it's our responsibility to be able to make that happen. So we have a very crucial judgment that we have to put in place, which is for every pound that comes into RFL, we have to determine how much to keep back to meet reclaims and how much to pass on to good causes. And those good causes are directed by uh, the Secretary of State at DCMS. So it's quite an important uh, judgment and it's one that we take seriously. And therefore, we're a very small organisation, but I think we've got quite a, uh, an important role. So therefore, the, the regulation by the FCA, um, the, the oversight by uh, government is, is really important. We, one thing I would like to say is that back in 2009, when we were set up, we were set up by co-op group. And Co-op Group remain uh, our parent today, um, and they supported the setup and facilitation of Reclaim Fund when they were approached by the government back in 2009 and then went live in 2011. So that's a sort of a brief brief history. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the progress we've made since we started, Um, but very happy, Lindsay, just to sort of hand back to you for a second and make sure that uh, that's the sort of information that uh, you'd like to get from us. 
no, that that's perfect. Thank thank you very much, Adrian. I think what what's interesting is is actually hearing that you obviously have a very careful process when you when you receive um, the monies in, so that you are um, ensuring that if people come forward and want to claim their monies, that they can recover them. But I think it would be great actually to hear some examples of of some of the good causes which have been supported by your work. Yeah. Okay. So the um, if I sort of start with some numbers, which I think is important, so I can give um, listeners. Uh, some context of some numbers, which I think is is quite powerful. So we started off with an ambition, and I say an ambition, it was largely set by uh, talking to financial services sector. We thought that there was about £400 million of dormant assets available um, to fund a scheme. Now, as things stand, uh, we've had over £1.3 billion into the scheme, which I think is a, is a huge testament to the energy and efforts by banks and building societies to participate in the scheme and that continues. Uh, we'll talk a little later about scheme expansion but at the moment the, the scheme is focused on banks and building societies and we have over 30 participants in that scheme who provided that £1.3 billion. And then of that um, over £740 million now has been distributed to good causes and the, the good causes are across the United Kingdom and they range from charitable organisations, social intermediaries. The, the way the money is, uh, is distributed is through the National Lottery Community Fund. And the Secretary of State in DCMS is responsible uh, for setting the direction of the spend. And in broad terms at the moment, the, the spend from money that banks and building societies provide to us, that we pass on, um, goes into three key areas. The first area is social investment. Uh, the second area is children and youth services. And the third area is financial inclusion. And um, in terms of, uh, of impact, we bring together all of our participating banks every year. We bring down some local frontline organisations from all parts of the UK, uh, and they share with us some of the impact that the money is having. So um, although there are a number of steps in the chain here in terms of how the money gets put out to the front line, it does go right down into frontline charitable organisations in those three sectors and genuinely changes lives. And then I think I'd also just add that in terms of, of where the country currently sits, we're also very pleased that we've been able to support a further distribution in the last few weeks which the organisations that I just uh, talked about in terms of the spend directions, there are key organisations that we work with. So we work with Big Society Capital, we work with Access, we work with Fair for All Finance and Youth Futures Foundation. And all four of those are responding to a much needed COVID-19 effort in terms of putting money out to the front line in terms of much needed uh, support and relief um, to what's going on in the country today. So I guess we started out really with, you know, one key purpose, which was to be you know, very much sort of supplement um, the charitable activity in the, in the UK. But in recent times, I think the scheme has become even more important um, and has played a, is, is starting to play a part um, in supporting the, uh, the recovery in the UK as, as we stand. Thank you, Adrian. That absolutely phenomenal. Actually, to, to the figures that you've mentioned, um, I'm I'm quite blown away. Um, and absolutely right. I think your work has been invaluable, particularly in the recent times. Uh, we, we we know that there's been a huge need, um, particularly from social, financial inclusion and children sectors. All of your sectors with the COVID challenges. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I was just going to bring Jay in actually at this point before we move on and, and look at possible expansion. Do you have any comments, observations um, from your work in this area so far, Jay? Well, I mean, our work from a registrar's point of view, and good morning uh, to, to you both, uh, our, our work in the registrar space has really been limited to what our issuer clients have always wanted to do um, and, and has been limited really just to dividend payment. Um, what the Dormant Asset Scheme and the Reclaim Fund have demonstrated over the last 10 years or so is that, that there is a great value in being able to look at what the what dormant assets are available and certainly have achieved a great deal in the banking and building sides of the world uh, and putting those funds out for good causes. 
uh, which is why the expansion uh, of, of the scheme is, is being considered uh, to bring in other fields. And it, for us, it's not just about dividend payments, outstanding dividends and cash. Uh, it, it also brings in outstanding shares, uh, which would need to be um, uh, liquidated into, into a cash position and possibly other cash assets as well uh, relating to corporate actions. So we're going from a position of, you know, the, the amazing 1.3 billion available through the banks and building society scheme to a, a, an enormous figure uh, which, which is currently unknown in, in our world, but, but certainly into the hundreds and hundreds of millions um, being available just from, from uh, corporate issuers. Uh, and then, of course, there, there, are, there are other players as well, whether they're pensions or, 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 or in the insurance field. So the expanded scheme is, I think, going to be, for a society product, is going to be a, a, a wonderful addition in the coming years. We have some challenges around that, though. Uh, we, 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 uh, we need to consider definition of dormancy, um, and, and that uh, is something that is ongoing at the moment as part of the consultation process. And we're working with our partners and stakeholders and uh, other interested parties on, on defining that. But from a from a reclaim fund perspective, we're excited uh, about what can be achieved in the future, uh, and I think what Adrian has pointed out is what can be achieved in actually a relatively short period of time is, as you say, and using your words, phenomenal. Thank you, um, Adrian. Could I ask you to talk a little bit more, just just uh, picking up on some of the points Jay made there about uh, what we might expect to see um, from the proposed expansion and next steps. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, I think the, I mean, thank you, Jay, for those those comments. I think they're they're very valid. We have been on the journey with the sector that you work in, in terms of we've we've sort of taken part in lots of roundtable meetings, technical working groups, and I think Jay makes a good point. It it, it is it is not without its challenge, but we faced those challenges back in two thousand and nine and ten with banks, where we sat down for the first time and we cut we we took a sort of very collaborative approach. And we worked through some of the challenges that we faced and we ended up forming the organisation. So I think that we've got a really good start point. Um, I think we've got a very strong foundation in RFL and a lot of what we do can be transferred into new asset classes. And as well as looking at the, the areas that Jay talked about, you may be aware also that we are, there are other work streams. So we're looking at insurance uh, and pensions and also looking at wealth management. So there are lots of other unclaimed assets that have been identified that are potentially being consulted on for inclusion in an expanded scheme. Um, so we, I, I guess what we try and bring to this is our experience of working with the current uh, Bank and Building Society scheme. We think it is scalable. Um, it does have, as I said, some some challenges but we believe we can we can work really constructively to overcome those. So so I think you know Jay's absolutely right. There are still multiples of millions of pounds of of dormant assets that we believe are out there that could be in scope, and I think it's well worth the collective effort of all of us to expand the scheme and and you know take take one point three billion pounds to you know goodness knows what number we could get to if we all work together to try and achieve this. Absolutely. I mean, I think you, you mentioned it there. For me, I think pension schemes has to be a big untapped area, really, with, with unclaimed pensions and lapsing pensions. That, that's, that's, that's definitely got to be, um, be uh, one of the top of the list, I think. Fantastic. I, I guess what, what would be good then, I think, for us to understand from our listeners' perspective is, is what, what can they do now to get involved? Obviously, there is the consultation and possible input into that. But Adrian, what would you suggest um, our listeners can do um, to help things move along or really just to get more actively involved in what's happening? Well, I, I think the great thing at the moment, Lindsay, is a lot of your listeners um, we, we've got to know um, over the last 18 months or so. So a lot of it has already started. I think the most important thing is that as an industry... It would be great if they can uh, continue to collectively work together um, to overcome some of the challenges that, that Jay mentioned. There is some work that needs doing to define dormancy. Um, so there are some sort of fundamental things that need defining um, in, in your sector, in your industry. But, but the crucial thing is that those conversations are underway. And under Robert's um, stewardship as the industry champion for the sector, 
we've had some uh, some tremendous engagement over the last few years. So I think in headline terms, it, it really is a case of continuing with that, that dialogue and those meetings and that input. And of course, the, the crucial thing is that we now have, as we mentioned earlier, in, uh, is a consultation now. Government have a consultation out on scheme expansion and they're inviting sectors, industry and, and the general public to comment on what proposed expansion could look like. The deadline for that consultation is now the 16th of July. It's been extended slightly uh, to reflect the environment we're in within the UK. Um, but there's still plenty of time now to, to go on and, and, and look for that. And it would be easily found um, by searching dormant assets and the government sort of linked to that. And the consultation really is asking for input. So so I guess overall, in two, two key areas, I think, um, take part in the consultation and share your views and please don't be afraid to be really challenging in those views because I think we, we want to learn what the barriers are um, as much as the sort of the, the eagerness and the keenness to be part of a scheme uh, is. And then the second thing is that we're very committed to continuing to work with your sector uh, and industry to support in any way we can um, to, to get the expanded scheme off the ground as soon as we can. Thank you. And, and Jay, uh, do you have any final thoughts to share? Well, I was just going to echo um, what Adrian uh, said there. Uh, we, we are conscious that, that, I mean, that the spotlight is now shining on, on the 16th of July date being the, um, the consultation end. We are, from a link perspective at least, we're going to be speaking with our clients um, to, to get them more involved in the consultation. From an industry perspective and as part of the Governance Institute, the ICSA, we and our peers uh, will continue to, to lobby for the positioning for, for all clients and, and uh, stakeholders uh, across the industry. Um, so there's, there's a terrible amount of work that, that, that continues. In addition to that internally, um, we are setting plans uh, aside now to, to bring in new procedure and process that will help actually drive uh, the the uh, collection of unclaimed assets in a more efficient manner for the future. Because one thing we will know for sure is once the expansion happens, it won't be a one hit wonder. Uh, it will be a rolling program annually, probably, uh, of collecting dormant assets over a 12 or 15 year uh, dormancy period, whatever is settled upon. Um, so we need that process and procedure in place and we're working hard to get that in place now to ensure that, that uh, the, the industry is ready and fully supported and committed to, to the scheme. Uh, and whilst some companies uh, will take the view that, that it's a voluntary arrangement, others will take the view that they want to be part of the wider society and, uh, and, uh, and the ethical benefits that, that the scheme bring. So we need to stand ready to, to support them too. So from, from our perspective, we're working closely within industry and with the DCMS and, and, and uh, today with the Reclaim Fund in bringing this uh, to the attention of all of our listeners. Uh, and that's going to follow, uh, be followed with uh, some, some other updates uh, over the coming weeks. So the next few weeks uh, running up to the 16th of July are going to be quite exciting in terms of Dormant Assets Reclaim Fund uh, reunification uh, and what else can be achieved so uh, it's more a case of watch this space thank you jay and i'd, I'd especially like to thank our, our external speaker today adrian smith of reclaim fund thank you adrian i think it's a fantastic positive story that we've heard today um, being able to use dormant assets for incredibly good valuable causes um, if you have any questions, listeners, please do get in touch with us. Otherwise, don't forget the deadline on the 16th of July for the close of the government consultation. And thank you very much. Keep safe and tune in again soon.